Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, both virtually and in person. We are here today to share with you the OCFO Academy and how you can be part of it. The OCFO Academy is a voluntary supplemental learning program providing employees with opportunities to increase skills and professional development experiences, creating a stronger and more effective OCFO. The Academy consists of four pillars. First is learning paths, second is details, third is CFO on the go, and fourth is speed mentoring. We'll hear more about each pillar later in the program, but before we get to that, I'd like to introduce and thank those folks who have been critical to getting this academy up and running. Tembi Seacrest. <laughs> Our OCFO Academy co-chairs, Kara Pavlik and Jim Bertotti. And Elliot Johnson, our Academy's Senior Advisor and Coordinator. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you as the outgoing OCFO Academy Executive Sponsor. It's been a pleasure working with this team, and I'm very glad to share that Kate Darling will continue as the Executive Sponsor starting next week. <laughs> Finally, this Academy wouldn't be possible without the initial vision of our CFO, Vinay Singh. We wanted to thank him for challenging us to rise to the occasion and to make his vision a reality. With that, we'd like to turn it over to Vinay to hear more about his vision for the Academy. Thank you. No music for me? <laughs> Good afternoon, thank you. Before we get started, I just want to I know it's very important to just recognize uh, the loss of one of our colleagues. Um, Winnie Watts Mitchell, who worked in financial management, risk management division for over 10 years. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, that it's the 80th anniversary of D-Day, the invasion of Normandy uh, today. Um, and so, although you always hear me talk about the great public service that you provide and the sacrifice that you and your families provide, I also take a moment to, to thank those in the military service um, for that. So I know there's some great talking points the team has had, so I'll See if you guys can keep up with me. I don't know if there's slides supposed to be behind me as I talk. We've heard from those. We can move on that. Let's go into the overview. Tembi, you said what, four, five, six? Five, six? <laughs> OK. But before getting into that, uh, you know, I like to riff. Um, and I was thinking about this week. You know, we all have bad days, um, but this is not one of those bad days. Um, I want to welcome all of you to the launch of this OCFO Academy. And although it's an official launch, you know, the work has started much earlier, definitely before I was here, before other leaders were here. This really should be the UCFO Academy. Uh, when many of the team gathered, I think almost 18 months ago, uh, this idea shined brightly. Um, but it's not new, it's you. Uh, and uh, so many of you have been teaching, perhaps maybe just yourselves, um, having that growth mindset, but so many others are teaching others across OCFO, across HUD, across OMB, other agencies sharing that learning. I'm really proud and humbled uh, of the work you've done to make this a reality. Uh, and I strongly believe most people know that, you know, what work to do, uh, what the work is that's needed, where the gaps are, uh, and how to solve for that uh, rests with all of you. It's that growth mindset that I really admire. And I'm thankful for Emily's leadership, Tembi's tenacity, uh, and all the team, the working group and team's passion to realize uh, what I hope you will continue to carry across CFO and across the government. This week, uh, I was thinking this morning, uh, maybe after I leave here in seven or eight months, uh, start a podcast called Connecting the Dots with Vinay Vijay Singh. But seriously, this week, as I was thinking about what was meaningful or just memorable, uh, Tuesday was my mom's birthday. Uh, she passed 15 years ago, and I just thought of that, not to make everyone sad, um, but really her story of courage and education was pretty amazing. You know, she gave up school at a young age to have me, um, and basically continued on with being a traditional immigrant housewife, although working um, and supporting my sister and I while my father was off. Um, he was there, he wasn't supportive, this is not anti-dad, but uh, you know, he was traveling the world, making a mark and getting us from immigrants to middle class America. And uh, you know, after 30 years, she went back to school uh, and at the age of 55 got her bachelor's degree. Um, 
And so this morning, how I connected the dots with that is I saw on my Instagram feed, as many of you do, doom scrolling as they call it, um, a picture of Morgan Freeman with a quote that said, uh, people that die don't feel the pain. Um, after they're gone, we feel the pain. But it's the same with ignorant people. They don't feel the pain, we feel the pain. Uh, and so as the medical industry talks about learning one, doing one, and teaching one, you know, I, I believe in that growth mindset. So always be learning. I'm really happy to see this come together, fruition. Sorry I didn't talk through these slides. I'm sure uh, we can, if you'd like me, I can kind of quickly go through them. Um, but what is it, right? Um, we're expanding knowledge. And again, this is not to minimize all the great work that goes in at HUD, at any department, with uh, great training teams, Ochico, our management staff, Tamika. There's so many things that are happening. But again, this is born of all of you. Again, like I said, I can't stress enough, you guys know what is needed, where the gaps are at, and the world is agile. We can't just lock in a training and say this is it for four years. Things change. So providing candidates with that opportunity um, of multidisciplinary approach, different learning paths, you'll hear a lot about that today. Next slide. Here's the sponsors we talked about, a lot of great folks here that made this a reality. Next slide. And it's built on these four pillars, right? The learning paths, the details, CFO on the go, speed mentoring. So I think we'll get into a lot of these actually in practicality, so I won't go in and take much more time, but I will turn it over to somebody else. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, sorry. My bad. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. No problem. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna briefly introduce um, our next few speakers who are gonna talk about each of the learning paths um, I think we can go on to the next slide too, to Justin first. Um, we have, the four different learning paths are really four different sort of ways that people may approach gaining more knowledge and experience and finding ways to add to their experience here at HUD and add to their own sort of personal understanding. Um, so next we'll have Justin talk about our first learning path. Thank you. I had to run up here. Oh my goodness, I was too far over there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really lucky because the CFO Academy team invited me to introduce Learning Paths to everyone. Super easy topic. I'm going to nail it. Uh, so what are Learning Paths? Uh, the official description is that Learning Paths are tailored, self-paced training programs to develop professional skills essential to the CFO mission, which can be accomplished as a cohort and promote cross-functional knowledge. But the simple description is that we asked a bunch of really smart people to write down the best resources uh, for self-paced learning in topics like AI, data analytics, accounting, and the federal budget cycle. So basically, we asked a bunch of SMEs to give us their best stuff on topics they know best. So overall, the vision with regard to Learning Pass is to give everyone in OCFO access to knowledge that they need to develop their career as a well-rounded CFO professional. Next slide, please. So who's uh, eligible to participate in Learning Pass? Everyone, everyone's eligible to participate from GS3 to GS15, and everyone can benefit from Learning Pass. And where do you find Learning Pass? They're on OCFO's intranet page for CFO Academy, and they're all in Word. So you can download them right now and start reading them and using them. Next slide, please. So our inaugural learning paths are focused on AI, data analytics, accounting, and the federal budget and appropriation cycle. And if you wanna get started with a learning path, you just download it and you consult with your supervisor you know, to discuss your professional developmental goals, and then just start taking classes. Each learning path has links that you can sign up with, and some classes are in, in Compass, which you'll have to register for, and some are on public platforms like Microsoft, Google, and LinkedIn Learning. Uh, there are also learning path guides and counselors that are available to uh, counsel you. So follow your self-paced learning path and you'll have an opportunity to create a capstone project or to complete a detail using the skills that you have acquired. And we recommend that learners keep a record of all their completed courses and projects. And at the end of your learning path, the outcome is that we're gonna issue you a certificate of completion. So uh, we're really excited about these learning paths 
It's a great example of the democratization of knowledge. They're open for everyone. And we invite anyone who has a learning path idea to share it with us, share it with the CFO Academy, and create your own learning paths. They don't have to be on technical subjects. They can be on soft subjects like public speaking uh, or anything where you're, you're a subject matter expert in and everyone's a subject matter expert in something. Uh, so at this point, I'll pause for any questions. All right. Thanks for making it easy, everybody. <laughs> At this point, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Elliot Johnson, who's going to discuss details. I'm not running. <laughs> <laughs> I'm OK. So. The uh, best way to describe the uh, details, and I'll use some uh, uh, personal experiences. Back when this place, we used to have to come to the building uh, every day, um, and we met with each other. You would have opportunities to do a lot of these things that you'll see in the detail opportunities. So you'll have a developmental work assignment outside the employee's normal daily position, requires a purpose, primary purpose to help them develop skills and competencies. That used to occur in discussions in the cafeteria, somebody going up to a coworker's desk and just saying, hey, can I get your help with this? Um, I would say I've been here roughly more long, longer than I care to remember. And there are folks who are the age that I am now who helped talk me off the building and taught me things about the mission of this place and what we do. And it doesn't make a difference what your background or experience is. You have an opportunity to learn about the full set of what happens at this place by sharing experiences, whether it's helping somebody read uh, uh, when, when a, uh, an area needs the assistance of additional uh, energy from someone to carry out a particular task, short term. What we won't do is, uh, with these developmental details, if they are short, they will it, uh, not violate anything that we do with, the, with, with what Ochico requirements are. There'd be, Anything from, can I get you for a couple of days? Can I get you for a few hours a week? Can I get you for a month or so? Uh, there, obviously, you have different workloads that are critical at certain times, so you're actually looking for folks who can help out and develop the skills over a period of time. So uh, you, they, right now, we're going to uh, go through a process of compiling details, opportunities, or uh, uh, on, on a website, and the managers will come up with them. And it's an opportunity to learn and grow. Uh, next slide, please. Well, that serves it for me. <laughs> I'm out. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tempe Seacrest. I'm Vinay's Chief of Staff. And first of all, I just also want to say a huge thank you to everyone who has worked on this project. This is a culmination of months of hard work, deep thinking, engaging, talking to all of you. And um, I, I think we've come up with a really great program. And um, again, let us know what you want. Um, this next pillar is one that I'm personally very passionate about. We call it CFO on the go. And the idea behind this is to connect you with HUD's mission. So a lot of you stare at spreadsheets all day long. You look at numbers, try to make sure the budget from this year meets the other year, and it can feel hard to, to feel like you are helping people get housing or redeveloping communities. It just, you are disconnected. So we wanted to get our team out to field offices to actually see what we, as HUD, all together accomplish. You are just as much a part of what are our people on the ground working directly with the clients who need help. They wouldn't be able to do it without what all of us do. So um, this is a, a couple of pictures from our very first CFO on the go up to Baltimore. And we heard some amazing stories. And for me, there was a lot of light bulb moments of, my gosh, here are some successes that we were able to experience firsthand. And here are some opportunities that maybe we can solve some problems. I know one of our team members who came 
uh, went to Baltimore, came back, and immediately started doing a training program when she realized that there were some areas that, that she could help make things smoother for our grantees. So um, we have a couple more opportunities coming up. We're taking a team to Washington State next week. Very excited about that to visit some of our ONAP tribal grantees. Um, we have, um, I think some of you went on the, the DC uh, visit up to Walter Reed and saw our senior housing and veteran housing. Um, we'll do another DC tour to the Navy Yard area, see some of the community redevelopment work that's been done in that area. We have a trip coming up to uh, Montana, which we were just finalizing today with uh, Mela Jo and Scott, who will be leading that one. Um, and then a couple more local opportunities to Richmond, which Kate Darling will be leading, and to Pittsburgh, um, which uh, David Cruz will be leading as well. And we'll continue to look for opportunities um, to just make these connections uh, as much as we can one day in and out. I know a lot of you are very busy. Um, but these are also an opportunity for you to meet your colleagues. So we try to make a group that represents at least one person from each office. So if you're in systems and you have an accounting question, you at least know one person that you sat in a van with for a couple of hours that uh, you can ask and hopefully get pointed in the right direction. So take a look at these opportunities. Sign up for them. If you have any questions, let me know. We would love to have you on these and um, just feel more connected with what we do and get your feedback on how we as HUD can do a better job. So I think after this we have our um, uh, Sophia Osho with our Envision and New Hire program. So Sophia. Hello everyone. Thank you for being here today. I joined HUD in January and it's my distinct honor to be up here and to speak about this new Envision and New Hire program that um, I brought to the attention of some of my colleagues when I was in the Baltimore on the UF, uh, OCFO on the go trip. And I mentioned that I wanted to share my passion for project management. And as a new hire, I felt that there were ways that I could potentially uh, mentor and offer a peer-to-peer -peer opportunity for staff to come together on a weekly basis. And so this is what I'm offering. And my next slide, please which is um, achieving peak performance for new and seasoned hires. And we wanted to add a seasoned hired aspect to this because we all have something to offer one another and there's an opportunity for us to come together as uh, experienced seasoned employees and as new hires and to come together as a peer-to-peer -peer sharing of knowledge, but also talking over things like project management, development of individual um, systems in SharePoint and Outlook and of various other topics. So it will be my honor to uh, lead that and I hope that each of you will take an opportunity to bring your knowledge and uh, your time to be among your colleagues and make an offering uh, for this program. So thank you so much for having me today and our next speaker is going to be Haley. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Adam and I have been looking forward to this for months. <laughs> All right. As my esteemed colleague Haley Gallagher said, thank you again for coming uh, for us to discuss what speed mentoring is. Uh, Haley, would you like to go over uh, what we envisioned speed mentoring to be? Absolutely. So some of you are thinking to yourselves, what in the world is speed mentoring? What did I sign up for? Well, it's what you're about to experience in three minutes. <laughs> And our MC is going to be Emily today, and we're going to have all our mentors come up and panel on this stage. Emily will be asking them a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask them some questions as well. Uh, from there, there will be a 15-minute trivia break, and then we are going to tables in the back of the room where every mentor will stay put, and you guys can walk around and talk as you'd like. Please feel free to ask them any questions, and we're excited. Next slide. So the reason that we put all of this together for all of you was because we know that one of the key tenants at HUD is networking and is the people. So that's what makes us all come into work and that's what we really wanted to focus on today within OCFO. We wanted people to be able to connect across all offices in OCFO and all levels in OCFO. Um, 
Given that, we thought mentorship would be the best way to allow people to ask questions, think about their own career, and really reflect with their colleagues in kind of a guided discussion type way. Um, from there, we're trying to build as much community as possible. Thank you guys for coming. So here's the list of all the wonderful people uh, who will be the mentors today. Uh, and they will introduce themselves as they come up onto the panel. We have uh, mentors both uh, here in person, physically and virtually, uh, where you'll get to ask them uh, multiple questions uh, about uh, community building, leadership skills, uh, or any other thing that pops into your head. Next slide. Yep. Next slide. Yep. Well, the fun doesn't stop here. We have future events planned. Uh, we are uh, planning to do other tabling discussions, other virtual events, uh, possible um, partnership with OCF on the go, if uh, it will allow it, um, and other suggestions that we wanted to get from you. You know, OCF on, uh, uh, Speed Mentoring is not just uh, a program that we want to uh, head. We want to make sure that we are providing a worthwhile experience for everyone in OCFO. So if you have any ideas for events you would like to see uh, to further your career, please reach out to us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to have a discussion because, again, this is uh, a program to connect those not only across um, each program office uh, within OCFO, but all senior uh, senior leadership levels and um, just across HUD as uh, HUD as well. So uh, that is uh, where we're going to lead into the actual panel. So okay. all mentors uh, who are here physically, if you could please uh, line up and come to the table, uh, we can begin uh, part one. Thank you. All right, let's start with introductions from our panel. Max, do you want to go first? Sure. Max Ben Grant, the Deputy Performance Improvement Officer, Director of the Strategic Planning Performance Division. We are a team within OCFO budget that manages the strategic planning process as well as the performance management process tied to the department's strategic goals and objectives. So much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Terry Dawson, the Director of Financial Reporting in OCFO Accounting. Um, I'm currently under the leadership of Ms. Ann Butler. So, Eric. All right, uh, Eric Rios, Acting Director, Administrative Expenses Division and CFO Budget. I've been at HUD for uh, about seven years now, and prior to that, I had 12 years at DOJ. Uh, Kristen Wright, I am the Assisted Housing Branch Chief in the Program Budget Division, and uh, we manage all of assisted housing, so all of Section 8 and all of the self-sufficiency programs that you hear about. Good afternoon, I'm Wilmer Graham. I serve as HUD Chief Risk Officer, now in the office of the Chief Risk Officer. I have now been here at HUD for about, uh, about three and a half years now. Uh, it has been an awesome experience and taking on this responsibility. As Chief Risk Officer, we have the opportunity to work across the department to identify potential challenges and threats that would imp negatively impact our being able to achieve the mission goals and objectives for the department. And so we have the opportunity to work with the 16 offices across HUD where there are risk officers for each of the program offices. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. Great, thank you to our distinguished panel. Lots of good experience from across government too. Um, so I've got a few questions here. I can ask them, and then we want people either virtually or in the room to feel free to jump up and ask a couple questions to our panel, too. My first question personally is, imagine you were about to start a new job. <laughs> what advice would you give someone <laughs> about to start a new job? Go ahead. <laughs> I need a pen. Right? I'm going to jump in there. <laughs> I'm going to jump in there because I feel as though coming over to the Department of Housing and Urban Development about three and a half years ago was truly starting a new job. Um, I had been with a very small uh, federal agency for multiple decades. And so coming over here at HUD, I knew the first thing was to be curious. I wanted to come in with an open mind. I wanted to come in and build relationships. I wanted to come in and learn the mission. As a chief risk, well, actually when I came in, I was not the chief risk officer. I was, senior, I was an advisor to the, to the um, deputy CFO, focusing on financial management and risk management. But I knew everyone that I was going to be working with um, uh, knew, I was, uh, knew that I was new 
to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so I could not come in as though I knew everything. I had to come in curious, asking a lot of questions, um, temper, tempering my judgment. Uh, when you've had the opportunity to lead risk or internal controls or strategic planning, uh, performance management across the entire organization, coming into a large agency, I felt as though I was gonna have just a lens. But what I quickly learned was that I was going to be working with everyone across the department, vertically and horizontally, with an extremely small team. And so I had to figure out how to build relationships very quickly and to hold on to those relationships through a matter of trust. And so those were things that I was highly focused on. Thank you. Others? Um, I guess I'll go, because I, I guess I have the, like, the next uh, smallest tenure here. Um, have a champion. You were my champion. I want to tell you that, so thank you. Um, also, you know, have this reassurance to the team, uh, the team that work for you, that you are not there to drastically change things. No one's going out the door. You are there to, like, like Wilmer was saying, be curious and also come with a position of understanding. Just, I just want to see what you do. I, I'm not here to change anything right now. I just want to see how this team operates because uh, I was very fortunate. My team had been a team for a very long time um, and they were experts. And so I was, you know, I'm only as good as you are and you guys are amazing and I want to support my team. And that's very critical. And I would say building on that too, use the opportunity of being new to the job or your portfolio or your position to approach people for new conversations. And at HUD, you can do that easily or elsewhere too. Just ask them if they'd like to get it a coffee or a lunch or something informal and pick their brains about their experience or how business is done from their perspective and what they find rewarding in the work that they do. And then you already have an open door for if you actually need them for anything work-wise, you already have a connection and someone that you know that you can at least start a conversation with. Yeah, I agree. For me, I've been coming here six years ago, but I am a second generation um, HUD employee. Um, my mother actually worked for FHA, so uh, she worked in single family claims. So coming here, I kind of ran around the halls when I was a kid, so that's kind of a big deal. But coming here, my team was already together, um, but they had been without a supervisor for years. And so they were fragile. They were a bit broken. And I just showed them that I was willing to come in and roll my sleeves up, and we were in this together. And whatever it took to get to the next level, that's what we were going to do. So I just came in with the mindset of whatever you need, if it's fouling, if it's actually doing some reconciliations, I'm here for you. It doesn't matter what great we are. Let's get this done. Let's work together as a team. Yeah, One thing I really admire about you, Emily, <laughs> is your ability to just I told Daniel the other day, you're like gravity. You just kind of bring people in together and you have a reach that's like incredible. I mean, just look at all the folks that attended your, your going away and all the folks that showed up taking time out of their evening. I mean, it's your ability to build relationships across external and internal stakeholders has been pretty incredible. I mean, you pretty much know everybody inside this building. You know all of the key stakeholders across, you know, on the Hill and at OMB. Um, so, it's just doing that. I mean, I think you're going to go there, and, and like in a year, everybody's going to know who Emily at IRS it's is. Not for, this is a generic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, they, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just, you know. Um, it's a master class. Yeah, yeah. 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 They, yeah. So just, just saying, I mean, very yeah. specifically for you. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. But it applies to everybody else. Oh, okay, it applies to everybody. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, well, I'll ask a couple other questions, and then if anyone else, Kara, do you want to start? You want to ask a question? Okay. Okay. And thank you all. Is this working? Yes, you can hear me. Um, I was just wondering um, what you all would say to newer mid-career employees who may have started during or after you know the COVID pandemic, who are now in a you know this really nice awkward hybrid work environment that we're in. What kind of skills should they be pursuing? What do you need to be successful in this environment? And I definitely don't have any special interest being a member of the HUD Under Five leadership team in asking this question. So asking for a couple thousand friends. <laughs> I think the ability to organize 
to like reset every day because some of some of us are in the office every day. Some of us pick their computer up and go one day a week. Some of us have that hybrid mix of between the two. Um, the ability to know, okay, this is my list of tasks. Um, no matter where I am, whether I'm in the HUD building, I'm on an offsite, I'm in my in my home with my PJs on. No judgment there, anyone, guys. Um, but you're getting the work done. You know exactly where you, where the pulse is of the organization for that time period, whether it's budget formulation or reconciliation, uh, wherever it is. You know exactly what what's going on in the office. That requires you to be very aware of you know what your team is doing, and then that's that you know, reaching out to your colleagues and your managers and saying, hey, just just to verify this is what we're working on. Is it QFRs for Kara? Uh, is it uh, budget formulation analysis for Emily and Vinay? It just it just depends on where we are in the, you know, in the in at least in the course of our budget year. Well one thing I would add to that is to always uh, make sure that folks know you are available. And we have the tools where we are multitasking, multitasking, multitasking. So even if you are in a meeting, particularly if you're sitting in front of your computer on Teams, if someone sends you a message, just take a brief moment, send a quick reply back, you know, letting them know when you're gonna be available, and keep going with what it is that you're doing. But I think in this environment, making sure that folks know that you're available, because you want, to know, you want folks to know that they can count on you, and that they have confidence that you, even though they can't see you, that you are getting things done. And um, so and to that point, uh, making sure that you have some deliverables to demonstrate that your time has been used wisely. And building on that too, I would say, take the time to be intentional about getting to know your colleagues and meeting with people. So when you are in the building, take the time to understand who's also in with you and stop on by just for a regular conversation. And even when you're fully remote, take the time to if someone's available on the calendar, just put time together for a one-on-one -on -one or a chat or see if they're free and available, and you can check in and just have a regular conversation with them even if there is no planned formal agenda. And if I could just jump back in there, um, Max mentioned putting time on people's calendars. People love to talk with you. I think uh, oftentimes they're, they're looking to take that 30 minutes out of the day, so I very frequently um, I used to do it more than I'm doing it now, so that remind, that's a reminder I've got to get back to it. I would just reach out to someone and say, hello, I'm Wilmer Graham, I'm the Chief Risk Officer, would love to lo know a little bit more about your area. I set aside this time, uh, this 30 minutes. If this time doesn't work for you, please offer an alternative. I'm flexible and keep it moving. And most of the time, they will, ex they will accept that time and they'll spend that 30 minutes with you and you've built a new relationship. Um, all of us are extremely busy, um, but I know senior leaders and, and the folks, uh, you folks, uh, any tips or tricks on how you actually keep growing and learning with all the other workloads you have, three, four hats at a time? I think folks would love to hear some of the, the newer folks. I think for me, I, I have learned that I love to learn, so personally, I'm always looking for opportunities to learn. Um, I think that you never get to a place where you're too old to learn something new. You haven't exhausted it. I'm almost a half of century into life. I know it doesn't look like, I know I look like I'm 21, but I'm not. But even at this juncture, I'm studying for two certifications along with wearing all the hats. So I say that not to boast, but I say that to say, you too can do it. So whatever it is that you've been thinking about doing want to do, interested in doing, it's not too late. You always have time to pick up something and learn or reach out to someone and say, hey, I'm interested in this. Are you willing to show me? Can you make some time? Can you let me know during the cycle in which you're doing that type of work? Maybe I can jump in there. So for me, it's about just always not limiting yourself, but knowing that the sky is the limit. Whatever you want to learn, you can learn. Whatever you want to do, you can do. Yeah, and I think for, for me, it, you know, the questions that we get into our office that I don't know the answer to are actually the ones that I try to, to really focus on and spend time on because, 
you know, it, it's very easy in our busy schedules to see something that might not exactly be in our, you know, in our, um, you know, area per se that we could just pass on to say another office. But that doesn't really help the person who's asking because they just kind of ping pong. So I, I usually try to take that item that I don't know what it is and, and, and figure out what the answer is or figure out how to help because one, it's, it's a little bit better for the customer and maybe they can help me out similarly in the future, but also I get to learn the specifics of something that we may not see at our particular level of the organization. Um, so I encourage, you know, if, if time allows and if it's mostly, you know, adjacent to what you do to, to go take it through those next steps to learn, you know, talk to somebody in accounting or talk to somebody in FM and make that connection because that's, that's knowledge that you can take you know, for, for you know, future things that you have to work on, but it's also a really nice thing to do for the person who's asking on the other side instead of forwarding the email. All right. I'm also going to add to this in the sense that, you know, in both the formal um, training environment, our CFO, I'm going to put in a plug for the next wave of uh, financial managers and leadership conference uh, that's coming up. I think they're having a new cohort in the fall. Um, our CFOs are executive sponsors, so if you want, you can go talk to Daniel um, Ballard. Yeah, he's shaking his head. I'm not in trouble. Great. Um, <laughs> I was just there with them, uh, the new cohort today. Um, that is a wonderful training opportunity, and there are many others like that, and that is being sponsored through AGA. So that is a uh, formal pathway. Informally, when you're sitting in a meeting and your colleague is talking about, oh, we're doing this reporting element or we're doing this new initiative, and you're like, hey, can I sit in on that? Don't be afraid to ask that question. Like, I have nothing to contribute. I just want to see this demonstrated. I just want to either see it on a big screen or see it on Teams. Um, most people will be happy to show you the behind the curtain. It may be completely Greek to any and all of us, but the fact that you're watching the realm of possibility and then maybe it clicks for you that it could help with this part of your job or it could help this person in this part of the organization. Those are the types of like little aha moments that, um, that really kind of make the day-to-day -day kind of pass faster, at least for me. And I would say building on that too, taking advantage of your colleagues and the people you're generally around, is even when you have meetings or informal meetings, you're walking around the building, keeping it in your mind. And if you walk past someone, say, in housing, that, oh, I didn't know anything about this in single family housing, you can ask them a question and see where they point you in whichever direction of who to talk to next or where to look or good resources to start learning more about something or to start getting more engaged. And just take advantage of them informally in those engagements where it's unplanned and a lot of the times coincidental, or even if there is some blank time in between your meetings remotely where you can just kind of plug in and just, hey, I saw on this and we got five extra minutes left in the meeting. I was wondering if you could hang on and we could have a discussion. One of the things I would add to that is don't be shy about pursuing development opportunities on your own. Uh, sometimes there's something that's happening here within the building or you may, uh, or outside of the building. If there's something that you have a passion for and you want to pursue, pursue it, whether you're getting support for it from the Department of Housing and Urban Development or not. They want to pursue it on your own. And then you never know, that may be an opportunity for you to build some relationships. And then I'm always uh, focused on being prepared for an opportunity. You never know, you may have the opportunity to bring that particular thing that you've now learned into the Department of Housing and Urban Development as yet an opportunity for the department to grasp on. And, and, and one other thing I would add to that, and Max, I'm sure will appreciate this, familiarize yourself with the strategic priorities of the department. Always make sure that you know what they are because those are the things that will get the, those are the activities that will, uh, where the, that, that's where the resources are going. And so if you're familiar with them and then there's a way that you can support accomplishing them, that makes you valuable to the department and to the leaders because those are the things that they're being held accountable for. If you're helping someone get something done that they're being held accountable for, then you're valu valuable to them. All right, I've got one other question up here and then we'll go to Tembi. Um, in the department, we often have surprises, setbacks, failures, things that we're not expecting. 
what skill do you find most essential in your job in dealing with that? Um, I'd have to say being a ninja. Um, <laughs> and I say that because um, in my current position, it, it, lead, it lends itself to, you never know what the year end is gonna look like. You never know what component is gonna surprise you with an issue. So I have learned to try to think three steps ahead, three steps behind, three steps to the left, and three steps to the right, um, always anticipating what could happen. Because you just don't know. You don't know if it's gonna potentially end up being an audit issue, if it's fixable, if it's totally broken, and then what do I need to do to get that done? So for myself, I'd say I'm acting as a ninja. I never know when the next um, action will need to occur. I like that, ninja. I would definitely say being able to reverse engineer the mistake so that you can at least very quickly course correct. Okay, we did this wrong. We should have done this. So that when this, when the scenes of this horror movie re arise again and you think that the, the villain is about to come out of the closet to kill you one more time, you already know, let me lock this closet door and we won't have this problem anymore. I'm sorry. I, I work with OMB on a regular basis and that is my horror movie. Uh, don't, don't, don't hide your head, you know that's true. Um, so being able to, you know, like Terry said, being able to understand, you know, okay, if we do this, OMB is going to do that. And so just to have that, um, you know, lessons learned in the back of my head. So that, you know, what we learned from 25, we won't have to make that same mistake in 26 or 27, so. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, especially if you're, um, you know, if you're in a position where you're supervising folks, I think kind of owning, owning the mistake and being able to move on, uh, it's not only healthy to do that because you don't want to dwell on it, you don't perform well in that environment, but you also show the folks that you're in charge of or that you have to lead that it's okay to make mistakes. I mean, if my, if my superior can make a mistake and they can move on and realize that it's not the end of the world, then I think that creates an environment where everybody, um, everybody can kind of per per persevere through those things. Um, and it's not only like mistakes that are intentional. I mean, sometimes things happen to the department um, as a function of you know changes in policy or funding that um, create circumstances that are very difficult to manage, and it's the same kind of situation. It's just sort of powering through that um, you know you'll figure out a way to make it work mentality that I think allows everybody to you know do their best work. And in that same vein, I would say keeping in mind your long-term goals of what you're working towards, so that whenever you hit those bumps or you get the no to look into the answer, the information you're receiving, and find out what they're saying yes to, that you can build on as you're working towards what you're ultimately trying to achieve. What I would add to that is the first thing, don't allow fear to take over. Because fear puts all types of negative thoughts in your mind, and before you know it, you're completely distracted from what you're supposed to be focused on. Another thing that I take into consideration is, I look at the situation and try to reframe it. Sometimes there are opportunities that can come out of surprises. So, 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 so thinking through how you might be able to reframe and, and, and to present uh, it, as, it as an opportunity as opposed to a negative thing um, is, is, is another thing. Another thing is don't take it personally. Our env the environment in which we are operating is highly dynamic, constantly changing. Um, you don't know going back to what I said earlier about staying in a curiosity mindset, you, don't, you may not know what is going on around you. And so if you start asking questions to try to get more information, you will, will likely find that it's not as bad as it may seem in the moment. And also too, the first thing I think about when I get a surprise or a setback, I shoot an email up to the top. I don't want them to get the same surprise that I get. I don't want it to come out of the blue, so I want to try to keep them informed. Thank you. Tembi? Well, I want to ask about critical career moments. So what was a moment in your career that um, made a huge difference? Maybe you took a risk, a, a terrifying risk, an opportunity that ended up being a really good one, 
or something that you missed, that if you could go back, you might make a different choice that, that impacted where you are now or the trajectory of your career? So critical career moments. I would say keeping in mind and always having an open mind is about opportunities that present themselves. I ended up on this team that I'm on, the strategic planning team, by sheer circumstance. I was at another part of HUD where I had a very difficult first two and a half years of the department, and I wasn't looking to stay at HUD at all. And I went to a conference and ran into people from OSPM, Strategic Planning and Management, and they're like, hey, you should come talk to our manager. We've got some open spots and looking at a detail or something along those lines. And then it ultimately turned into a job, and I met the whole team at the conference. And then eight months later, I was on the team. And now eight years later, I'm still here on the team. So just keep your mind out for opportunities where they, you don't expect them to present themselves. I would, I would definitely, definitely piggyback off of that. I started my career as an immigration officer. And I knew immediately after the first day, this is not what I want to do. Um, and I was given an opportunity to come to DC and be a budget analyst for the Office of Bureau of Indian Affairs. And when I got there, you know, started getting to the, like the, the, the really hard work of it all, I started seeing people around me and I was like, what do you do? Because I see you moving around the department, I see you asking questions, I see you making waves, and I wanna know how to get to where you are. And so slowly I just started you know, asking questions, being curious, going to our local um, DOI university, which would be, um, yeah, encompassed for us here at HUD, and you know, hey, how do I get here? And they gave me a path, and I took that path. So I mean, it was not just one career uh, moment, it was a, a series of very small ones in, in totality looking back, I'm like, I'm glad I did that. Because when I said I was going to DC, my parents were like, no, it's expensive, it's dangerous, don't go there. We're from Alabama, so I mean, let's just be real, everything's dangerous to them. Um, so yeah, just having those, you know, you know, I'm gonna take this chance, and not only that, I'm gonna start asking questions when I get there. I think for me, it was, it would be HUD. And I remember the first day coming on and my supervisor, Ann Butler, she was on medical and they gave me a long list of to-dos. We hadn't had a clean opinion. We were in bad shape. And I remember the next day calling her and say, I think I made a mistake. I think you have the wrong one. And she said, no, I have the right one. And we're gonna get through this and we're gonna take this one step at a time. And so once I got over the initial shock of, it's a lot, I don't know how we're gonna get through this, how we're gonna make it, and then realizing that you have the technical expertise, you can do this, you can stand in here, and you, can, you have a chance to make transformational change. And you have a chance to push people to their next level. You have a chance to allow people to learn things that they didn't think that they wanted to. And I'm gonna tell you, my staff was not happy with me because we were level setting the playing field for everyone. But once I got a little nudge from Ms. Butler reminding me that she didn't make a mistake when she took a chance on me and George Tomchek said, I'm gonna give you your shot. And he gave me my shot and allowed me to turn things around. So sometimes when it seems like it's a lot, just hang in there, because sometimes you're in the right place at the right time, doing the right things with the right people. I love that, I love that. Embracing opportunities, and that's, that's the way that I frame it. Uh, I had an opportunity to do a detail over at the uh, Office of Management and Budget over a decade ago. And coming from a small agency, I came in curious, asking a lot of questions. I think that, that got to be annoying after a while, though, but to, to folks. But, um, uh, but asking a lot of questions because I happened to be on a team with folks who had come from large agencies. So that then gave me the opportunity to learn more about what is the, the various things and the various challenges that large agencies were having, having that maybe we weren't having at small agencies and vice versa. Then I got the opportunity to pull together a cross-agency team. And at first, you know, because folks were familiar with the fact that I'd come from a small agency, and they're like, oh, she doesn't know, she doesn't know. But I embraced it. And before we know it, we had a very impactful cross-government team that was focused on benefit paying, to which a lot of the other larger agencies now wanted to be a part of. And we were able to, to, to do some 
impactful, have, have a lot of impact and do some impactful work. But embracing an opportunity is, I think, is, is what we would all consistently say. Yeah. Uh, this is hopefully helpful to folks early, early on in their career. Um, I, I started as a student intern, and I was working my way to what I thought was uh, this, the job I always wanted, contract specialist, procurement. That's the office I was in. That's all I ever knew. And I mean, it was only four years at that point, but it felt like forever. And um, it didn't work out. Like I, I you know, that that I, I didn't get that job, and I was thinking like, well, maybe maybe I need to look elsewhere. The federal government might not be where I need to to continue my career. And then I, um, you know, put in for an administrative kind of um, almost you know like admin support role in the budget office where I was, and um, I thought, you know, that was worth a try. And that decision is exactly like that's what put me on the path to where I am today. And I didn't know it at the time. I thought I would stay there and go elsewhere because, you know, I, I felt like I needed to capitalize on that immediate experience. But w what that showed me was that sometimes it's the things that don't work out the way you plan or that you, the way you think need to work out a certain way that give you the best shot for your future self, right? And it's, um, it's always something I remember when I'm thinking about even where I am today and where I might be going in the future is just to kind of remember, like, it's, it's not always going to exactly work out the way you think. So embrace those kinds of things, and, um, and, and the kind of mystery of it is, I think, kind of exciting, and hopefully that's helpful to folks who may be in a similar situation in their careers right now. Great, thank you. David? Yeah, going with hypotheticals, the hypotheticals again, um, imagine if the employee's rock star boss left <laughs> and you agreed to fill in their position temporarily until they found a permanent position, a person for it. Um, what advice would you give them to maintain the successes and the reputation and um, accomplishments that that person had worked very hard to have that office earn? So, I believe that whoever that person is that is stepping into that role, <laughs> It's a mystery, really. They knew that that person was more than capable of handling that role and that they were a great asset to the person that is currently vacating that role and that they know exactly what to do to steer the ship and go, keep it afloat and go, and keep the staff happy. So I believe that they're in great hands. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. I would also add Taylor, Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey jokes too, but you know, it's just, <laughs> good job, David. Yeah, I, I, was, I would also say um, just be yourself. Be who you are. Um, I always rem I'm always recalling that, the, that we spoke about the, how dynamic the environment is. The person who was in the role before shaped and made that role for what fit them. And so as, as hypothetically you are shifting into the role, this is a different environment from when that person came into that role. And so now you have the opportunity to shape it for what it needs to be today and for years to come. And eventually someone else will succeed you and they'll find the right person for that period of time as well. So you have to make it for what it needs to be for you. Excellent, thank you very much. I think we're um, almost right at two o'clock. <laughs> so we are at time to do a interlude for the next um, 15 minutes where we're gonna do some trivia and then we're gonna do some speed mentoring um, if anyone wants to ask some questions of our speed mentors here. Thank you to our panel and our speed mentors. We really appreciate it, all of you. We will see you out there. If anyone wants to stay for trivia, I think Jim's coming up next. <laughs>